My contribution uh, starts from a um, Pearson semiotic approach to archive studies based on the notion of performativity. This approach arose some years ago in teaching uh, semiotics for electronic arts at the Universidad Nacional de Tres de Febrero in Buenos Aires. And in that, in that context and within the research project entitled Semiotic of Performativity, led by Claudio Guerri and co-directed by Martina Sebel, we have elaborated some semiotics reflection about the complex theme of the archive, uh, the emergency and the uses. So today I, will, I would like to um, retry some of those research outcomes and entangle them with my current research topics and interesting facets where I'm working on the threshold on art and technology with a gender and biopolitical perspective. Um, as Bruno already said, my presentation is, can be thought as a program too. So the objective of, of my today presentation is mapping out a, methodolog a methodological proposal for understanding the social cultural narratives of face archiving and its consequences in terms of performativity. My hypothesis is that the practice of face archiving is capable of performing visages in a time and in a community displaying strategies of counter narratives of the identity. To meet my objective, I will focus on three different methods of face archiving that developed uh, from the ending of the 19th century to the ending of the 20th century. Uh, of course, 100 years um, crossed by deep social, cultural and technological impact where the body uh, become a part of a complicated device of power that disarticulated, measured and reassembled it. The, the methods so for face archiving are the composite portrait, a photographic technique invented by Francis Galton in 1880s and that fascinated uh, science, philosophy and art even today. The portrait parlay, the spoken portrait, and an identification technique invented by Alphonse Bertillon in the 1890s, in the early stage of the development of this um, anthropometric measurement uh, system. And finally, the Egan face as a machinic production of, of a portrait depicting the human face from the perspective of the machine. Uh, looking for a, rep a reciprocity between the human eyes and the machine eyes uh, developed in the 1990s. So since the last decades of the 20th centuries, the production in relation to archive studies has increased exponentially, a growth that marks the feeling of an epoch and that mm, demands uh, to employ an appropriate theoretical and analytical tools. As uh, reported by Patrizia Violi in the, <laughs> in the book that also my colleague Silvia uh, mentioned before, the archive uh, can be studied both as an iconosphere, a shared repertoire of a um, local visual en encyclopedia linked to a certain event, both as a dispositive in the terms of Foucault, of course, as a device of sayability capable of generating new discursive forms, narratives and practices. You can also see like two uh, pieces of art related with archiving by Christian Bolta Boltanski on the screen. To Viole's proposal, I'd like to add a nuance of a differential meaning related to the discursive production concerning the materialization of the archive. Every archive consists in fact of a certain accumulation of materials and requires a spatiality, more or less actual or virtual, where these materials need to be stored and clustered. In semiotic terms, we can think about archiving as a re-enunciation. And um, in this regard, a first approximation of the archive can be defining it as a support that preserves and rescues a narrative from oblivion to the point of becoming a memorandum. This support, so 
for this reason, the support is also a mnemonic because it proposes a technique for memory organized, um, organizing a narrative. Here we can find like two ideas of what an archive and this idea of um, um, building a mnemonic can be shaped both in the State Archive of Turin or in a film which use raw material archive, like normally known as found footage for the construction of a narrative. So applying a Persian, a first Persian uh, semiotics perspective, I could say that the archive uh, as a sign is something which stands to somebody citing the um, famous uh, Persian definition of sign. So something which stands to somebody, which in this case will be a certain criterion that postulate a narrative for something, a concrete memory forge support um, of an experience, an object, an image, a document that operates, something that operates as a substitute in some respect of cap or, or capacity which in the terms of an archiving uh, um, practice, it would be according to a criterion, uh, to a certain organization and classification. In the semiotic approach, the face as an archive material makes sense when it takes a coordinate that organize and systematize an identity, removes it from pure amorphous storage. And when the face archive, and, and when the face in and let the face archive to take a social interpretant that makes the substitution or the testimony or of an identity i i shared in the in the screen in the presentation this project of orlan because i guess it's, it can be like uh, symbolic for thinking of this idea of um, grasping the face from the amorphous storage. Um, Orlan um, took several um, chirurgic uh, operation to let the iconic face of, the, of, of, um, of Venus have been subtracted by her own superficial face. So um, let's go to the center core of the presentation, which is the idea of the face archiving. As analyzed by Alan Sekula in his uh, essay, The Body and the Archive, uh, the photographic face confronts us with a double system of representation capable of functioning both honorifically and repressively, and I quote, Photography subverted the privilege inherent in portraiture, but without any more extensive leveling of social relationships. This privilege could be reconstructed on a new basis. That is, photography could be assigned a proper role within a new hierarchy of taste, honorific convention where they're able to proliferate downward. At the same time, photographic portraiture began to perform a role no painted portrait could have performed in the same throat or rigorous fashion. This role divided not from any the derived not, not from uh, any honorific portrait tradition, but from the imperatives of medical and anatomical illustration. The photography came to establish and delimit the terrain of the other to define both the generalized look, the typology, and the contingent instance of deviance and social pathology. So to understand this role, this new role that the photographic portrait brings, I propose to apply the notion of performativity as a repetition of, conf of conventions able to transform a reality as analyzed by different interpreters like John Austin or Judith Butler. So what conditions are necessary for an archive face to act on, re on reality and perform a visage? Um, I, I have referred to archives as both a, 
a paradigmatic entity, a criterion selection, and the concrete institution, something that coordinates. In either case, the archive is a support for a series of relationships capable of um, according and, and therefore to produce a memory. What follows is the application of this methodological apparatus into the uh, case studies, the composite portrait or the, parlet, the portrait parlet and the Hagen face. In the three cases, we will see how the scope, re the scope realm of the archived face transform the visage habilitating and counter narrative for the identity. So let's go to the first case, which is the composite portrait or uh, a kind of archive that can be thought as the embedding the archive in the, in the face. So the starting point of the composite portrait is a repetition, is an act of repetition, a repetition of, of shooting and, and, and an assembling act that function as a promise against the variance of the human agency. Through its composite uh, photograph, Francis Galton, the inventor, would stack a photographic portrait on top of one another. The lighting and the scale in each portrait had to be identical with the face in the same for fa forward facing position. The result was that he exposed a single photographic plate to all the photographic portraits hanging on the wall. So this is the assembly art, the embedding the archive in, uh, in the face. Galton was a British uh, uh, statistician, <laughs> statistician, the cousin of Charles Darwin, and today considered as the founder of eugenetics. His interest in heredity and racial betterment uh, led him to join in the search for a biological determinate criminal type. Through the composite portrait, he attempted to construct a purely optical operation of the criminal type. He thought to visualize in the face the generic evidence of the hereditary laws. And I quote from the same Galton. Composite pictures are much more than averages. They are rather the equivalent of those large statistical tables whose totals divided by the number of cases and entered on the bottom line are the averages. They are real generalization because they include the wall of the material under consideration. The blur of their outlines, which is never great in truly generic composites, expect in unimportant details, measures the tendency of, individ of individuals to deviate from the center type. The process of pictorial statistics is suitable to give us generic picture of man, such as the theorist of the average man, obtaining an outline by the ordinary numerical methods of statistics as described in, in his work on, on anthropometry. By the process of composite, we obtain a picture and not a mere outline. So his composite portrait stands for the criminal type, for the statistical averages of the anthropometry of the face according to an essentialistic vision of the face archived. So this is, for example, the front page of this essay using the technique of Galton. In effect, Galton believed that he had translated the Gaussian curve into pictorial form, which now wore a human face. In this blurred configuration, the archives tries to exist as a single powerful images and the single images tries to reach the authority of the archive. In search for an essentialist and optical model, Galton raises the indexical photographic composite to the level of a symbolic and express a general face through the, through the creation of contingent visage. In this way, Galton produced an unintentional face caricature of inductive reason. Composite portraits signify not because they embodied the law of error, but because they are rhetorically annexed to that law. For example, I just changed this um, picture, this figure of my presentation after the intervention of Gabriele. This is the work of Galton 
uh, about the Jewish type. But um, uh, there is another question to take in account regarding the composite portraiture. Composite photographs appear as a re recurrent theme in Peirce writing. As Chiara Ambrosio state, like Galton, Peirce thought that ideas bear the hallmark of generality. But contrary to Galton, Peirce filmy believed that, that the capacity of arriving at readable yet fallible generalization falls fully fully within the remit of our cognitive powers. And this was a quotation from uh, um, Chiara um, Ambrosio. Another philosopher, Luke Wittestein, was extremely fascinated by the composite portraiture. And here we go to the first counter visage allowed by the face archived. Here is, is the portrait composed by Ludwig and his sister Gretel, Hélène and Hermine. And I quote from uh, Lila Lee Morrison uh, book of, of uh, 2019, Automated Portrait, Wittgenstein produces a kind of intervention. He invites us to engage in a perceptual inquiry into the space between the sign and the objects its name, it names. The sign is loosened is loosened from the grip of fixed ideas. In this space of inquiry, there is a fluidity of meaning, possibility, and variation. Though Wittgenstein's sense of what the composite show us is very different from Galton. Given Wittgenstein's interest in paying attention to particulars, he had an altogether different perceptual interest in the composite portrait. Wittgenstein described the composite portrait as a picture of possibility of, of probabilities. So the composite, uh, the composite is an image of multiple perceptual outcomes that, rather than a singular probability of a type. This is the big differential with uh, Galton. And the composite image has an ability to exhibit all the particular instances at once, as we can see in this composite portrait of the Wittgenstein brothers and sisters because of his ability to show all aspects of a concept together, Wittgenstein described the composite uh, um, portrait as liberating the eye. So a completely different uh, idea respect to Galton uh, perspective. So I'd like now to go to the second case, which is the portrait parlé, the spoken portrait that can be thought as the um, face embedded in the archive. So during the same years of Galton, the, Pali the Paris uh, police uh, official, Alphonse Bertillon, invented the first effective modern system of criminal identification. It was a bipartite system positioning a microscope individual record within a macroscopic aggregate. First, he combined photographic portraiture, anthropometric description, and highly, and highly synthesized and abbreviated written, written no, uh, notes on a single fish, which is uh, this one. I guess it's quite famous anyway. Second, he organized this card within a comprehensive statistically based filling system. Bertillon would go on to his system of physical description, description into a precise scientific languages, which he called, and I quote from Simone Cole, a morphological voc vocabulary. So for example, in this vocabulary, a description like cicatrice reticular of dimension of one centimeters, oblique external in middle phalanx of middle finger left side position face would be coded in this way. Mm. Bertillon foresaw a situation in which his morphological vocabulary could become a universal language able to be transmitted via telegraph. For Bertillon, the mastery of the criminal body necessitated a massive campaign of inscription, a transformation of the, fa of, of the face sign into a text, a text that, that, that paired, verbal, that paired verbal, de verbal description down to a denotative shorthand, which was then linked to a numerical series. 
the face of the arrested had already been defined as criminal by means that subordinate the image to verbal text and numerical series. So if Galton composite portrait can be seen as a face archive where the, visual, the, where the visage implodes, in the portrait palais, the visage explodes. And um, in this regard, Carlo Ginsburg identifies in the portrait palais some influences in the, the Morelian method, which is a famous method of art criticism, which works through the comparison of external details, which would reveal the automatic mannerism, like, for example, the, wear, the, the way of doing uh, ears, as we can see in the bottom part of, this, uh, of the screen, of each artist and though the scientifically power of their identity. As here is like the, the practice no, of the uh, portrait parle. Here is the fish. So as suggested by Secula in the, 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 essay, the essay that I mentioned before, from a Persian perspective, we can say that when Bertillon subordinates the photograph to the verbal text of the portrait parle, he remains anchored into an indexical order of meaning. The photograph was the physical tra uh, trace of a contingent visage. In support of, th of this thesis, I'd like to show you a counter-exploded visage, an archive that invites us not just to look at it, but also to listening to the images. This is the Gulu Real Art Studio, an installation of studio portrait collected by the, the Italian photographer Martina uh, Bacigalupo, or Bacigalupo, listening to the images, engages the images as conduits of an unlikely interplay between the vernacular and the state. Taking a counterintuitive approach to understand the quiet as well as the quotidian, and I'm quoting from Tina Camp's uh, work on the, um, on the installation of Martina Bacigalupo listening to images. The installation theorizes the form of subjectivity enacted through the vernacular practice of identification photography. These images explore the lower frequencies of transfiguration enacted at the level of the quotidian in the everyday traffic of black folks, folks with objects that are both mundane and special photographs. What are the lower frequencies of these quotidian practices? And how do we engage with their transfigurative potential as a vernacular practice mobilized, mobilized by black people in diaspora? Photography is an, every, is an everyday strategy of affirmation and the confrontational practice of visibility. So I go to the, um, the third case, which is the, the Egan face. And um, the Egan face, which is, of course, the, the latest uh, in, in the terms of time uh, uh, example, is an appearance-based approach to face recognition that seeks to capture the variation in a collection of face images and use this information to encode and compare images of individual face in an holistic manner. The method was introduced in the 1990s by two MIT scientists, Matthew Turk and Alex Pentland, who developed in his conjunction with the television rating companies for the purpose of uh, monitoring ratings. It was designed to be used in TV sets to, to determine which individual within a whole sound were watching TV at which times. So feeding this information into customer rating for a specific uh, television program. Um, 
So we can think in this sense of the eigenphase as an interface of, of a TV that, watch, that watches you when it watch, um, that watches you as you watch it. Given this context, the ideal situation for the algorithm to operate is real-time situation in which people are sedentary. Ideally, the faces to be recognized would be all positioned conveniently, that is, squarely in front of the TV screen. Facing uh, forward facing pose, no? which is like a kind of isomorphic uh, is it, uh, um, question in, in all of these uh, um, archived phase. At the time of its introduction in 1991, the Egan phase method was considered one of the first facial recognition methods successfully to perform face, de face detection and recognition in real time. But the recognition does not need to produce pictures to understand its own process of recognition. So the picture is designed for human eyes. The Egan face image serves as a training image not for the algorithm, but rather for us, for the humans. It allows human eyes to see like algorithms, not for the algorithm, um, yes, not for the algorithm, and uh, it allows the human eyes to see like the algorithmic eyes. As a window into this, pro into this process, the image answer one of the criticism of face recognition system, that is the lack of reciprocity uh, as a system that identify people without identifying with people. But observation of the Egan face image provides the very opposite of the, clarity, of the clarity concerning a person identify. We can mostly speak about a phantom image. The Egan face image depicts a moment of stasis between the multiple inputs of data from the training set and the singular outputs of recognition. In this sense, um, the inspiration for the eigenphase algorithm was the thought that it might be possible for algorithmic processes to mimic the process of human recognition. These images can be defined in this sense, in this regard, as technical images in the terms of uh, uh, William Flusser. And there's an example of what the artist Arun Faroki has termed uh, as the operational images. And I quote from Faroki, the aesthetics of which we are not intended, instead of representing the objects in the world, these images are doing things in the world. They are part of a process. They are information and not, and not really images. Operational images are produced by a machine and are self-reflexive in the sense they, that they depict both the condition of, the, of, of observation and what is observed by the machine. In this way, the Egan face images is, in a sense, a pure information. As the last case of um, counter narrative of the information of the informative visage. I'd like to show you a part of a larger project, which is already shown in the screen, called Even the Dead, the Dead Are Not Safe, which is a project of 2017 by Trevor Paglen, a, a, a project that, of course, used this kind of technology, the again face. And in, in the egg and face portrait in this project, they are not formed by a, an average of multiple faces, but rather from a compilation of multiple facial images of the same subject. For this subject, it shows part, uh, philosophical and literary figures such as Franz Fanon, who is uh, the one represented in this case. And also other in figures like Beckett or Simon Weil. Mm, we can see, we can recognize uh, um, an hunting portrayal of the ghost of Fanon uh, with his face veiled in a pallor and the color of, uh, of his skin only retained around the shadows of his eyes and the lips and along the edges of the face. 
And as Lilia, um, Lila Lee Morrison's observed, this portrait though appears as something of a warning from of a warning from the past, like Walter Benjamin takes on Paul Klee and Angelus Novus. And as an angel of history, the ghostly gaze of Fanon looks back, back at, uh, at us from a renderis, a rendering of his likeness created by the by, by systems of surveillance as something to fear. In the aesthetic plot that unfolds before the observer and, the, and that unconceals a network of connection between black and white men, between past and present, between old and new geographies, between symbolic arenas and physical space, the image that bounces back to the eyes is not that of a man whose identity has been shown, but that of a man whose identity has been erased. Franz Fanon, Franz Fanon himself, who in 1952 proposed the idea of the porosity of the condition of, the condition of subjugation imposed by the colonizer on the colonized and coined the concept of the epidermalization of, an, um, of the inferiority, now is counter epidermalized visage. So I don't know if I'm fine with the time, but I'm just going to the conclusion. That's fine. Okay. So this approach allows to identify areas of, in of investigation pertinent to face archiving with specific and articulated problems at the, at the same times. Furthermore, it permits to us to expand the study of performativity of the archive and recognize the dimension involved in the effectiveness when archiving faces. An effectiveness capable of producing the face that he records and producing strategies for visage narratives. narratives. Thanks to this approach, I propose a passage from the visual representation of the face to the face as a support of a visage. The face becomes a support insofar it constitutes a support for an identity resulting from inscription, from discursive materialization and experiences. In this sense, the archived face does not only preserve a narrative, but it makes a narrative memorable in the very act of displaying a mnemonic to remember it. This is what Derrida, and I quote, refers when he said that the archive is not only the place for stocking or for conserving an, archi an archivable content of the past, which would, which would exist in any case, such as without the archive, one still believes it was or will have been. No. The technical structure of the archiving archive also determines the structure of the archivable content, even it is very coming into existence and in its relationship to the future. The archivization produces as much as it records the event. And paraphrasing Derrida, I can say that the archivization of the face performs a visage, a visage as much as it records its narratives. Thanks. Okay.